welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It is the 16th of July. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your very latest weather information and situation. No matter what part of Alaska you're in, you can listen to your NOAA weather radio. Find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska. The weather info line is available at 800-472-0391. Find each weather service office on Twitter. All of us on Facebook under NWS Alaska, and during the afternoon you can find a map update of what's going on in Alaska for the next couple days to come on YouTube, or you can find the complete show by searching for AKWX TV on YouTube. After this show, you'll get the complete broadcast there. Here's a look at hazardous weather tonight. You'll notice across northern parts of southeast, flood advisories are still in effect. Uh, watching for some elevated stream flows there and also across western sections of Alaska. Flood advisories will continue through tonight and into tomorrow for the interior of the Seward Peninsula and along uh, the, uh, the middle Yukon Valley and out toward Norton Sound. Again, flood advisories are still in effect. As far as fire danger goes, uh, with uh, quite a bit of rainfall moving in across western and central parts of Alaska, we are starting to see the effects of where the rain has not been falling in eastern sections of uh, the Alaska Range and northward and also across some parts of the Chugach, still looking at some uh, slightly dry conditions enough to bring up that fire danger, but mainly in isolated locations there. So this is not widespread, uh, but there is some elevated fire danger in those areas. Most areas lately have seen uh, enough moisture that that fire danger has really been tamped down considerably. And it looks like uh, the flow that we've seen right now will continue at least into the next two to three days. You'll notice the main storm track coming off of eastern Asia is uh, well to the south and west of the Aleutians, moving in toward the Gulf of Alaska here and just off screen. You can also notice the circulation right here across the southern Bering Sea. It's stretching out as it pinwheels around high pressure that's really pushing down on the atmosphere and limiting the amount of cloud cover here and stabilizing the atmosphere. Uh, but the uh, uh, subarctic uh, jet stream here that's uh, uh, moving in from the south and west is really pushing a lot of moisture uh, right into the interior in the west coast and that trend looks like it continues. In fact, you can see where those clouds are kind of bubbling up uh, right here across southwest into the interior. That's going to bring more rainfall for you uh, in the central and western sections of the state as a cold front is dropping from the northwest to south and east. South of that, you see high pressure uh, trying to work against low pressure across the Gulf. A lot of cloud cover here, but not a whole lot happening underneath it with weak circulation of low pressure that's well away from southeast. And once again, like we talked about yesterday, a lot of the models are having trouble resolving where this weak area of low pressure is going to go. In fact, uh, earlier today had a, about a 1,000 mile difference between the furthest west and the furthest east uh, low pressure uh, on, on different models there. So that's not really good. Uh, so our forecasters, of course, uh, using the human input, have placed that system across the central gulf and will move it slowly eastward. That should eventually bring some rain to southeast in the coming days. And as you look northward there, you can see quite a bit of cloud cover across the Arctic coast, but quite a bit of open uh, sky there across south central, southwest into Bristol Bay, and even some patches of dry weather there south of the Aleutians, again, under the effects of high pressure. Now I'm going to caution you here and warn you briefly that I made a little bit of a map change tonight. I want you to take a look at that, and if you love it, great. If you hate it, great. Let me know. I'd love to hear from you. David.Snyder at NOAA, N-O-A-A dot gov is the email. You can find me on Facebook as well. Just give me your, uh, your uh, view on whether or not you like the white lines there for the isobars or not. Trying to make this a little bit easier to read. If it's not, that's great. Let me know that. Low pressure up across the Bering Strait is dropping colder air 
from the north and west to south and east into northwestern Alaska. You can see some areas of rainfall there moving into the Chukchi Sea coast and warmer areas working its way northward. The visible satellite picture here shows a lot of cloud cover, but not a whole lot happening underneath it in most parts of Alaska, as best we can tell. And here's that weaker area of low pressure across the Gulf that just isn't being resolved very well. Uh, as that travels eastward slowly, uh, it'll make room for another wave working its way in from south and west of Kodiak into the western Gulf. That one is not being resolved well either. So again, we're trying to do our best with that. High pressure out across the southern Bering works its way a little bit to the west tomorrow. That's at 1,026 millibars. A weaker area of high pressure across the northern Gulf has been keeping most of southeast fairly dry and warm today. Northward tonight around the Talkeetnas and north and east into the Alaska Range, there's an opportunity for a shower or storm. You've seen the clouds building up today. But further north, the better chance of getting wet exists from Norton Sound into the uh, south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range. And IFR conditions should be expected as you start your day tomorrow as a result. A 996 millibar low there in the Chukchi Sea is slowly working its way eastward. That builds in a little bit more to 999 millibars by Thursday afternoon. Uh, pockets of showers or a storm or two across the eastern Alaska range and into the Copper River Basin tomorrow. Most of that will be northward, I think. A high pressure still in charge there just off the shore of uh, Yakutat at 1,016 millibars. And here's that wave of low pressure. It's gathering warm and wet air and building that northward into the Gulf. To the west, the uh, more substantial weather maker will be the colder air dropping in across the Seward Peninsula and Nome by the end of tomorrow and into Norton Sound. On the back side of that, watch for a pretty quick change into a northerly flow dropping through the Bering Strait. And yeah, that's going to bring some colder air with it as well. It's also wringing out more moisture across the Yukon Valley from west to east. Uh, perhaps a little more showery across the Alcan border and out to the west. High pressure means uh, low clouds and stratus, but probably not a whole lot of precipitation there. Again, the southeast and most of south central probably staying dry. As we get into Friday, uh, showers and rainfall focusing more on the west and the interior than south central. Southeast starts to see some light rain moving in from oh, all the way from Sitka southward toward Metlakatla. Uh, Gustavus, uh, northward probably dry into Yakutat. Northward uh, even more around the Alcan, you'll see some showers there around the low center. To the west, showery weather around Kotzebue Sound and another wave of colder air trying to build in from eastern Siberia. That will take a little bit of time before it organizes, but you can see the general pattern here. Uh, flow from northwest to southeast is going to bring uh, more of these weather makers into the interior as we head toward the weekend. Here's the temperatures now. 50s and 60s across southeast today. Hyder was up to 72. Juneau in the mid-60s. Yakutat 59. Prince William Sound, most areas just shy of 60. One exception outside of Prince William Sound was Seward at 60, 61. 66 in Homer, 61 for Kenai. And uh, we did make it above the 70 degree mark for a little while in Anchorage today. I believe that's the sixth time so far this July. So certainly mild. 69 around Talkeetna, Fairbanks was showing 68 around 4 o'clock, 65 in Eagle, 67 in Northway. Fort Yukon was looking at mid-60s there, 63 in Arctic Village. Anaktuvik Pass was 55, Barrow 56, and Atkasuk was 63 degrees with Kaktovik, a cooler 40 degrees. 57 around Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. Wainwright, 46, about uh, 52 in Kivalina with Shishmaref at 57, Kotzebue lower 50s. Nome was 47, Unalakleet in the mid-50s there with McGrath at 66, Galena 55. Bethel showing lower 60s around Savunga and Gamble. Temps held in the upper 50s in the northern bearing. The Pribilovs were looking at mid 50s today with Kodiak just shy of 60 at 4 o'clock. Around Bristol Bay, upper 60s to about 70 degrees, especially once you get out toward Lake Iliamna. The Alaska Peninsula was in the 50s and 60s with Cold, Bo Cold Bay and Sand Point uh, in the low to mid 60s this afternoon. On Alaska and Dutch Harbor, about 58 degrees. Mid 50s uh, to lower 50s for the central Aleutians and Attu was showing 49. Overnight lows will hover in the upper 40s and lower 50s for southeast with south central in the upper 40s and lower 50s as well, including Anchorage closer to 55. The interior in middle Tanana Valley in the mid 50s around Fairbanks and Fort Yukon. Uh, most of the Brooks Range temperatures generally in the mid to upper 40s tonight with the Arctic coast diving into the mid 30s from Barrow westward toward uh, Wainwright and down the road toward Point Lay and Point Hope. 49 in Nome. Uh, looks like Bethel, about 51 tomorrow when you wake up. Upper 40s for Bristol Bay, 40s and 50s for the Alaska Peninsula. The Pribilovs in the upper 40s to lower 50s for highs tomorrow. South Central hovering in the mid to upper 60s for the afternoon. Low to mid 60s for Southeast. Kodiak, 63 for your Thursday. 68 in Fort Yukon, almost 70 there for Fairbanks. 40s and 50s for mo most of the Arctic coast. The exception, Wainwright could be a little bit colder at 39. Remember that northerly flow is also dropping south. So watch for cooler temperatures again there tomorrow. Nome at 54. Tomorrow's flying weather shows IFR conditions west of the YK all the way through the St. Matthew Island waters. 
pockets of uh, the coastline around Norton Sound and the interior, thanks to rainfall. We'll be looking at IFR conditions as well as the Chukchi Sea Coast and some areas south of Sitka along the coastline and southeast should expect to see IFR conditions during the afternoon. Pass conditions for Attigan and Anaktuvik Pass, we're going to see uh, IFR conditions, especially in the morning hours, maybe some improvement in the afternoon. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass should be trending toward uh, improved visibility. Same goes for Rainy Pass, though you may start out at IFR for Thursday. IFR conditions also expected to improve to visual as we head through Windy Pass and Isabel Pass should see improvements. Watch for convective weather in the afternoon. Same goes for Mentasta, but starting out VFR and lasting through most of the day with that exception. Uh, Tinita Pass should head toward VFR conditions during your Thursday. We should see improvements in Portage Pass by the afternoon, and Chilkoot and White Pass are expected to be MVFR through most of Thursday. There's certainly some cooler air around the low pressure center around the Gulf of Alaska and through Kodiak Island in the Alaska Peninsula and parts of Bristol Bay. But the big surge of colder air is north of the Bering Strait right now. You can see the freezing lines drop as low as 2,000 feet here and the surface freezing line just barely in view right there. So there are some changes coming as we head through the next 24 to 36 hours. Across southeast, freezing levels are as high as 10 to 12,000 feet. Icing potential is somewhat limited, mainly to the higher of flight levels there, above 10 to about 14,000 feet. Along the Yukon Valley, all the way out toward the YK, uh, below 14 to above 10 once again. And northwest around the Chukchi Sea Coast, as low as 2,000 feet, but below 12,000 feet there. Some of that could be light to isolated moderate. As we look at the jet stream, the uh, Arctic jet is dropping southward and uh, into the Seward Peninsula there with some pretty fast speeds behind that trough at 100 knots or so, more of a south and westerly flow coming across the Beaufort Sea Coast. The main core of the active weather, though, that's well south of us is being driven by winds up to 80, maybe 100 knots or so. Most of that's moving into the Pacific Northwest and moving through the very southern part of the Gulf of Alaska and keeping most of the active weather out of reach of Alaska itself. So our main weather maker is the northern jet stream in this case. At 9,000 feet, we have a westerly flow. It's moving winds onshore about uh, 10 to 20 knots or so across the Seward Peninsula, Norton Sound, and all the way east toward Eagle and Northway around 35 knots. We have a little bit of a stronger flow out over the Gulf. It's 55 knots. It really slows down as it works into uh, southeastern Alaska around 20 knots. And the northern side of this system here is producing winds moving from east to west along the Aleutians and just south around 20 to 25 knots. Across the Arctic coast, winds are moving about 20 to 30 knots there, generally from the west and southwest. You can see some changes there uh, north and east of Barrow as that trough of low pressure drops toward the Bering Strait. Otherwise, across the interior, southwest and south central, you're looking at more of a southwesterly flow. It's pretty light, 10 to 20 knots there. And winds coming in from the south and west to southeastern Alaska at 10 to 20 knots, thanks to that ridge of high pressure located off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, with high pressure still in charge across the western Bering. The turbulence potential then generally above 1,000 feet, you're going to find a lot of uh, probably wind shear tomorrow across the interior. It looks like the winds really pick up in speed, so it'll mainly be due to uh, speed shear rather than directional. Out across the Bering Strait and northward, some light to isolated moderate chop. Watch for convective weather across the eastern Alaska Range in Talkeetness, and there's also an opportunity for some turbulence well south of the Gulf of Alaska. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back with a look at the ice edge, of course, in your marine weather. Stay tuned. We've dealt with crosswinds, landed on short fields, dodged obstacles, and handled other hazards associated with GA's ups and downs. Now, let's take a look at the most dangerous category of all takeoffs and landings, night operations. All right. No, I think that's about it. That should do it for now. Thanks a lot. We sure will. Bye-bye. Those have got to be the best ribs I've ever had. <laughs> I told you. Okay, you guys got the weather? Yes. Yeah, it's about 8,000 scattered just to the north of here and then VFR along the road. All right, sounds good. Uh, just remember, uh, climbing out of here, we need a pretty healthy rate because it's still a little hot outside. Got a high-density altitude. Yeah, I took that into consideration. I wish it was still light out so we could see the mountains out there. I could take the uh, left seat if you need me to. Yeah, right. No, I think I got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to positive rate of climb and gear up and then establish uh, best angle. You know what that is, right? The rate at which an airplane climbs the most altitude in a given distance. Uh, all right, all right. Don't pull my leg.
89 knots. <laughs> okay, good. Positive rate, gear up, and uh, clean up the airplane, and then best angle. Yep. Anything else? Are you telling me, Captain? No, I think we're ready to go. Hey, guys, look at this. It's a very good deal for Tomahawk. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, he could afford it. <laughs> oh, come on. Seatbelt's fastened. Check. Good. Tray table's in the upright position. <laughs> yep. All right, here we go. Mountain Valley traffic, arrow 4432 Foxtrot. Taking the active for departure, runway 17, Mountain Valley. Positive rate, gear up. Okay, best angle, get the flaps up. Yeah, I know, I just can't see anything out there. All right, just watch the airspeed and the attitude indicator. All right, 85 knots, wings level. All right, we're looking good. I just wish I could see something out there. Do you remember what the highest elevation is? Uh, let me see. The accident portrayed in that scenario actually happened. The pilots and their passengers were fortunate indeed to walk away from the deadliest takeoff accident scenario. Less than 6% of takeoff accidents occur at night, but more than 36% of fatal takeoff accidents occurred in hours of darkness. The pilot and co-pilot failed to note the departure instructions, which called for a turn after takeoff instead of climbing straight out as they did. The plane came to a stop just a few feet below the ridgeline. Incidentally, maybe you noticed the gear light. It's more than I can say for the pilot and co-pilot. The pilot raised the gear handle, but because she hadn't disabled the automatic gear extension system, it wouldn't retract. See, the system is designed to assure pilots don't have gear up landings by automatically dropping the gear below a set speed or leaving them down if they're already there. Could the extra drag created by the gear have made the difference between clearing the ridge or landing in a tree? Well, we'll never know. What we do know is that a night takeoff is one of aviation's most dangerous evolutions. If you're flying from an airport in a sparsely populated area, once you take off, you'll have no outside visual reference. And the cues the body gives you give erroneous sensations about which direction is up. For example, the acceleration of takeoff gives a sensation that you're pitched up. That may lead a pilot to lower the nose and run into the ground. There may also be obstructions around that you can't see. A night landing is one of aviation's greatest challenges. They're complicated by the lack of depth perception we have at night, along with other optical illusions. A wide runway may appear closer than it is, causing a pilot to try to land in the air. A narrow runway may appear farther below you than it is, and may cause pilots to fly the plane into the runway. Because of optical illusions, the approach path at night tends to be flatter, so there's a greater possibility of hitting obstructions. Here's where approach slope indicators are most appreciated. Use the VASI or follow ILS glide slope cues to stay on the glide path and out of the trees. Unfamiliar runways without glide slope indicators are best avoided at night. This is not the time to go into short field airports. Your vision is degraded, fatigue may be a factor. It's all working against a safe outcome. Takeoffs and landings that involve transitions from VFR to IFR and vice versa bear special mention. Here again, focus is usually on the difficulty of landing, but the takeoff is perhaps more of a challenge. With a low ceiling, you could be in the soup in a matter of seconds, getting on the gauges without any warm-up. Conversely, when landing, you transition from flying blind to having your eyesight restored. We don't want to minimize the attention it requires, we just want you to realize that takeoff into IMC requires at least as much respect. Many of us operate multi-engine aircraft, and these require special attention during takeoff. Theoretically, a twin is safer because of the redundancy of the power plants, but that doesn't apply if one of the engines goes while they're developing full power and flying slowly, as they would at takeoff. It's often been said that if you lose one engine in a twin, the other will take you to the accident site. 
Unless the pilot immediately recognizes the situation, determines which engine is dead and feathers it, the engine failure is likely to result in a fatal accident. As the plane quickly approaches stall speed, the asymmetric thrust from the one working engine pulls the aircraft over onto its back. Redline defines the VMC, minimum controllable airspeed. If you lose power during takeoff below redline, you have no option but to pull back the power on both engines and land straight ahead. Concentrate on control. Many planes have rolled over from the asymmetric thrust before the pilot could wrestle them back to the ground. The blue line marks the single engine best rate of climb speed, VYSE. At that speed, you'll be able to maintain control and depending on density, altitude and load, you may be able to climb on one engine. But these are no guarantees. As a matter of practice, no light twin does well in single engine climbs. And if it's a hot day or a high airport, the airplane may not even maintain altitude. The speed between the red and blue line is where the art of flying can save your life. In this thin slice of the airspeed indicator, pilot skill makes the difference between a hangar tail and an NTSB accident report. Stay current in single engine emergency procedures. Expect to lose an engine. Consider periodic simulator training. Recognize the situation and take immediate corrective action. That's how to make sure two engines double your safety instead of jeopardizing it. The old saying that a good landing is one you can walk away from isn't quite true. At ASF, we prefer to say a good landing is one where you can use the aircraft again. Pilots who understand the art and the science of these phases of flight have a much easier time handling the ups and downs that go along with them. We hope that this presentation has brought you closer to being a part of this group. From all of us at AOPA's Air Safety Foundation, happy takeoffs and landings. As we said yesterday, there is no longer shore fast ice across the Chukchi or Beaufort Sea Coast there, so all of that is moving around out in the water. There are some open leads there east of Barrow and north of Kaktovik. Look at all the open water across the Beaufort Sea. Uh, north of Dead Horse, you see a little bit more of that ice filling in there. Uh, things are changing and will continue to change for the next month or so across the Arctic there, but so far it doesn't look like there's a clear path from west to east around the Arctic Ocean out of the coastline. Here's a look at the southeastern marine forecast now across the inner waterways. We're looking at light winds and seas running around 2 to 3 feet with a breeze coming in from the south and east, more of a southerly flow across the Lynn Canal. And onshore winds are also light around 10 knots or so with seas between 3 and 4 feet. As we get into Friday, a little bit of a change there in the circulation, but still looking at light winds under the effects of high pressure. Seas remain small in the inner waterways, around 2 feet or so. An onshore flow around Yakutat into the northern entrances, 3 to 4 feet. More of an offshore flow there from Sitka to Craig, 10 knots with 4 to 5 foot seas expected on Friday. Across south central, a light and variable flow inside and outside of Prince William Sound into the northern gulf. A westerly flow uh, just east of the coastline from the Kenai Peninsula. More of a west and southwesterly wind in the Cook Inlet west of the Barrens and Shelikov Strait looking at 15 knots with uh, two to as high as six foot seas there south of Kenai uh, coming into uh, Resurrection Bay and uh, actually I should say Kashemak Bay uh, 15 knots with a five foot sea more of a southwesterly flow again inside of uh, the Shelikov Strait four to five foot seas on either side of Kodiak Island. As we get into Friday the winds are going to pick up a little bit more in the strait up to six foot seas there also looking at stronger winds west and south of Kenai to Homer around 20 knots with a six foot sea and the western gulf still looking at generally light and variable flow until you get into the north where that's more of a 15 knot flow from the west with a seven foot sea northwesterlies east of Kodiak with a seven foot sea expected there. 
across the Alaska Peninsula. An east to northeasterly flow on the south side in the western Gulf. Uh, you're looking at uh, areas coming into Chignik around 15 knots with a 5 foot sea. A northeasterly flow south of Sand Point with an 8 foot sea there. Otherwise, light winds on the Bering side inside Bristol Bay. A 10 knot flow from the west becomes 20 knots by Friday. 5 foot seas there as we head into the afternoon. 6 foot seas a little bit further south. And a north and westerly flow on the Pacific side with seas as high as 8 to 9 feet on Friday. Across the Aleutians, a north and easterly flow will be predominant. Uh, look for a three to five foot seas there from east to west, maybe as low as two feet actually, north of Unalaska and Dutch Harbor with more of a variable flow. And northeasterlies could bring seas up to six to eight feet on the Pacific side for Thursday. By Friday, north and westerly winds are pushing uh, up to about 25 knots there around Kiska with a five foot sea. A variable flow on the Pacific side south of Adak and Atka with a six foot sea. Otherwise, westerlies 15 to 20 knots from Adak, Atka all the way out toward Unalaska on the northern side and on the Pacific side. We're looking at 15 knot winds with a 7 foot sea. Across the west coast now, look for a northwesterly shift behind the cold front that's dropping southward. More northerly winds across St. Lawrence Island, 20 to 25 knots. Otherwise, southwesterlies continue from Hooper Bay southward toward uh, the Kuskokwim Bay and the Pribilovs at 20 knots. By Friday, you'll see that colder air dropping southward even more. 20 to 25 knot winds continue with 6 to 8 foot seas in the north and 4 to 5 foot seas there in the south around St. Paul and St. George is the northwesterly wind at 15 knots. Across the Arctic coast, an onshore flow for Cape Lisburn and into Kotzebue Sound. Looking at southwesterlies north of Barrow up to 20 knots and more of a southerly flow north of Kaktovik with a four foot sea. That becomes southwesterly with time on Friday. And here comes that north and westerly wind coming into the Chukchi Sea coast at 20 to 25 knots with six to seven foot seas there by the end of Friday. Recapping tonight's weather, rain and maybe an isolated storm across the Alaska Range is possible there, but the core of the wettest weather will be across the central and western parts of Alaska and the Chukchi Sea coast as a cold front drops southward in the next couple days. Southeast, you're looking at high and dry weather, a few more clouds as we get into Thursday and eventually rainfall on Friday. Uh, the best chance of getting wet will be across the western coastlines and across the Yukon, especially the lower Yukon, with areas of uh, coastline looking at more of a northerly flow as we get into Friday and Saturday. And a slow moving disturbance is tracking eastward, bringing a better chance of rainfall by the end of the week for southeast. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.